Kitchens have a reputation of being brutal, uncomfortable places, but they're not, because none of it's personal. It's about winning. We were the first British pub to win two Michelin stars, and it's amazing. It's that kind of pub environment, and the people that were working in that tattooed, drinking, it was a big drinking culture when we won two stars, and it was all about working really hard, playing really hard, being a part of, everyone was on this journey that was leading it from the front, and we were on it, and we were shotgunning cans of Stella before Sunday lunchtime, and just this kind of, uh, all of these guys I thought were like the Royal Navy, and we were like a pirate ship. You have to risk everything, you have to sacrifice so much and you have to be fully, fully committed. You are in control of your own destiny and I wouldn't swap that for anything. Hey everyone, it's Jake here. Listen, before we get going, I just wanted to drop in and say a huge thanks to all of our new subscribers. This channel is growing like crazy and here's the truth okay the more subscribers we get the bigger the channel becomes the bigger it becomes the greater the names that we can attract so before you watch this video please just spend five seconds hitting subscribe it's good for us but it's also great for you and it really helps grow this channel thank you so much and enjoy tom nice to see you nice to see you gents thanks for having us thank you for joining us so what do you believe high performance to be for me personally, I went on a journey in kitchens as a chef um, and I was very lucky that as an 18-year-old, I found a, a world that I loved. So, you know, there's so many people that go through life that just have jobs and do things just to exist um, and then live for a weekend. Uh, and I, I've always thought, no matter what, when I was at school, like I wasn't great at school. I wasn't the naughtiest boy, but I wasn't the education system at that point wasn't necessarily for me. But I always thought it was really weird that people would work five days to have two days. In fact, surely the five days should be the thing that you enjoy. And I was so lucky that as an 18 year old, I went into a kitchen and went, this world, this is amazing. I love being immersed in this environment. And that was first. And it wasn't about performing high performance. It wasn't about cooking mission size. It wasn't about this. It was about being in a world that I just really loved. And then I started to realize that because it's such an amazing industry, hospitality is such a special place. It's so diverse and eclectic of the kind of people that work in it. And it's all the better. You can, you can create an amazing career from it. And you kind of realize that when you're in it, 18, and you start looking around, you start seeing people that traveled and been places and seen things and done stuff. And you start thinking, like, I never thought you could do that coming, you know, single parent family from a working class area of Gloucester and just going, hold on a minute, I just, like, people have, visited these spaces, try, you know, and, and, and being a part of because they can cook and you, know, you just go, well, this is amazing. So I started then questioning and trying to get, realizing that if you push yourself, the better you can be, the more experience and the more fun that you can have and gain. And then I think across that journey, I mean, I've been cooking, been kitchens and chefs in the hospitality for 32 years now. And then it starts becoming, I think the point when you start working as a, in top kitchens, you start realizing you look around you and you see that there's other chefs in there that are from the same sort of backgrounds or different backgrounds or some that are even worse. I used to work with a guy that couldn't even read or write, but his cooking was exceptional. And you start looking at these people and you go, they're uh, like, I need to push my, I need to start picking up on that. I need to question myself and push myself and drive those things. So I think high performance, I think is a self-driven thing. I think it doesn't matter, you can, it, and you, then you need to surround yourself by people who also want to perform at that level. I think, I think you have to find the, the balance between all of it. And then, and it's also, it's not an overnight thing. It's a long journey. It's a long thing to that point of success or where you think you're successful. Like, and, I, I, and I question that. I say, I don't think we are. I, you know, and I, do, I look back at it and I go, well, maybe we're doing all right. But there's always that I think you've probably talked about it to people who are self-made and done it before, that there's always that, there's a fear. There's always a fear that it's just going to disappear. And that's the thing that keeps you driving. So it's, it's a constant, and it's almost like every day you get up and you have to push yourself. You have to ask questions of yourself every single day in every aspect of everything that you do. So are you as driven now, what are you, are you 50? Yeah, 50, yeah, 51 this year. Are you as driven now as a 50 year old, as the 18 year old that first walked into the kitchen or even more driven? I would say even more driven, but in a very different way. So when I when you walk into a kitchen, it's quite, and the parallels is funny. We were talking about it before 
we started kicking off with this, but about professional sport and the parallels with kitchens and cooking, there's, there, it's very similar to professional sport in lots of ways in terms of, you know, if you're a football player, you know, the players that, that, that are moving the fast, quick, getting in the action, they're, they're the younger chef. You're 18 to 30 five you know and that you know that's almost professional sportsman range and they're the guys that are pushing and quick and hard and asking questions of themselves and the young guys are learning from the ones that are more experienced but they're all together as a team and that kitchen is gelling and then from there you start ending up being those head chef positions where you're at the front of the kitchen which is almost becoming structural player manager almost and then you start becoming the restaurateur and the understanding and you become the manager and you start beginning to understand what's going on and then there's the adrenaline factor there's the um kitchens have a reputation of being brutal um and uncomfortable places but they're not because none of it's personal they're not they're the same as in a in a rugby match or a football pitch or someone makes a mistake a player the captain, you know, like loses his shit with the player. No, like it's not about, it's not a personal attack. It's next time pass the ball in front of me or make sure that this is there. Or, you know, those kind of, it's about winning. And it's a, and that's the same sort of thing that happens in a kitchen, in a kitchen service. Because at the end of it, you know, it's all gone really well. Everyone's high-fiving. It's a brilliant service. Well done. Everyone has a beer. It's great, you know, and you go on to the next, you know. So it, those parallels sit quite tightly. But as you get older, I think a more when you were younger, you're driven. You're driven to work hard and it's about graft and it's about commitment. It's about pushing yourself every single day. And I have the same drive now, if not more, but in a really different way. It's much more management structured. It's much more, you know, we have six restaurants. We have an, a, a festival business. We do books. We do television in a production company, all of those sort of things. So it's about trying to organise and structure, you know, deals that are right, make sure that the business runs properly, you know, where the clean food is kept and, you know, I, I, I like I, I, the rotor writing, I, I don't deal with now. I do deal with how many staff are on and we'll ask them those sort of questions. But, you know, that that day-to-day -day grind, I'm not in, but I am very much hands-on of trying to create and push and push myself. And also, I think, give the team opportunities to grow as well. That's a big thing. Take a look here and tell me if you notice anything that links all of these conversations on high performance. I was wearing this, my Whoop band. This is wearable fitness tech that feeds back what's actually going on inside my body. After hundreds of conversations on this podcast, I'm told all the time that consistency is king. And what does Whoop do? It tells me about my strain, it tells me about my sleep, it tells me about my recovery. Once I used to think that I was the kind of person that could cope with high stress, without a lot of sleep, without going to the gym for a couple of weeks. And then I got Whoop. And then I got the truth. I mean, I can take a look at my phone right now because last night I was at an event for my daughter. I needed eight and a half hours sleep. I got less than five hours. What does that mean? Well, it tells me my recovery is only 43% and that my heart rate variability, my HRV, how my heart's beating, is lower than its usual range. So that then tells me that today needs to be a recovery day, not a heavy gym day. Honestly, Whoop has changed the way that I feel uh, about everything and I'd love it to do the same for you. So if you want to get involved, then you can. Just go to join.woop.com forward slash HPP and you can join risk-free for 30 days with no commitment. It's changed my life. It might do the same for you. The, like, I like the parallels there when you're talking about the football and, and the parallels with the kitchen. And it reminds me of that great quote from Arrigo Saki, the old Italian manager that said, you don't need to have been a horse to be a jockey. You know, when people used to criticise his lack of playing career. Yeah. Do you think you could be a good leader now, though, if you hadn't have done those years in the kitchen? Uh, no, absolutely not. No, you need, to, you need to come through an understanding of how kitchens work. Kitchens are really eclectic. It's a wonderful mix of different people, and it slightly attracts people that are, I don't know, a little bit left field, a little bit outside of normal society, um, kind of thinking, you know, people that are quite often, um, kitchens have got loads of chefs in them that have, uh, you know, maybe ADHD, some form of, you know, a, a communicative kind of difficulties or people that, you know, are not really sociable or they're really sociable, but they're, they're prone to, I don't know, addiction issues. They're prone to, like just people that are, um, 
don't necessarily conform to the norms of society, very similar to the kind of like musicians or, you know, that kind of world that people are creative. Um, and what happens is that you need to understand those people. You need to be able to connect. You need to be able to get the best out of those people. And you can only get the best and understand those people from working with them, being with them, um, connecting with them. Understand How do you connect with, like genuine connection with these people? What's the secret to that? Um, I, I couldn't tell you the secret, but I do think you need to talk to people. You need to be honest. I think all good leaders have good communication skills. I think all good leaders try to connect with an individual, even if it's just for 10 seconds, mm. ask them how their day was. And, you know, if there's a young 18 year old chef that's in our kitchen and I haven't been into one of the kitchens for, I don't know, two weeks, cause I've been all around and I get in there and there's a young chef that's just started. It's really important for me to go and say hello to them, welcome them for their point of view of them going, oh my God, that's the, the owner. They might have seen me on the telly. They might have a book. They might, you know, and they're in the business and make them feel welcome. And just for those points, you need to understand ask their name, try and remember their name. You know, all these sort of things are really, really important. And then I think um, try, just ask personal little bits from them. But then also yeah, a lot of it comes from banter. A lot of it comes from, you know, taking the mickey. A lot of it comes from just making them feel that they're part of a crew. And I think that's so, so important to team building um, and I imagine it's in every industry and every business, but I can only talk about it with the way that kitchens and restaurants kind of work. But there is a, a connectivity of how people work. And, and then people find their own kind of social standing, don't they? They find their own position in that group. But you have to make the group accessible for those people to feel that they can grow and be a part of. And what the secret to that is, I couldn't, I, like, I don't know. I think you've just got to be yeah. in it. But you've described it previously as being like, a pirate ship, yeah. right? like a band of brothers that yeah. you go into it. And I think there's lots of people listening to this would that it sounds really seductive and they'd like to be a part yeah. and belong to a world like that. So what what were the characteristics of that kitchen that first made you think, this is my my people, this is where I belong? So my world um, when I first went into it as an 18-year-old, one of the first kitchens that I left, I mean, there was always lots of Mickey taken. There was always knives being hidden. There was always your shoes being vac-packed and, and dumped in a stock pot. There was always, like, stuff that was going on. It was always, you'd leave the, the kitchen one night and your whole car was cling-filmed up and you'd just be like, oh, my God. Like, you know, like, just loads of just, like, absolute idiots. And what did that do for the environment? I, like, it made it... It has to be controlled because if it's with the wrong person, it would feel like bullying. But actually, if it's somebody that, you know, like as they all drive off beeping their horn, laughing at you, pulling the wanker sign, you're just like, like it's funny. Do you know what I mean? You're just like, oh, like, you hurry up, get the drinks in because they're going to the pub. You're going to meet in there for last order. There's all that kind of banter stuff that goes on. So you're connected to it. And that pirate ship analogy is, um, it came from, it was actually when the Hand of Flowers won two mission stars. And we won two Michelin stars and there's loads of other incredible, we were the first British pub to win two Michelin stars and it's amazing. It's that kind of pub environment and the people that were working in that, um, there's a connected, I mean, tattooed, drinking, it was a big drinking culture when we won two stars, like for me, and it was led by me, I was a huge drinker at that point, massive. And it was all about working really hard, playing really hard, being a part of, everyone was on this journey that was leading it from the front and we were on it and we were shotgunning cans of Stella before a Sunday lunchtime and just this kind of uh, attitude. And then there were other two Michelin star restaurants like the Manoir or the Gavroche or these well-established places that everyone was in hundred pound, like, chef's jackets and everyone was smart and ironed and crisp and like and we were like a bunch of blokes in tracksuit bottoms and t-shirts and stripy aprons that cost eight pound do you know what i mean and it was just like this kind of our cooking when it came to the plate and what we did was equal so all of these guys i thought were like the royal navy and we were like a pirate ship that was equal to them or if not more scary to them because we, it was this bunch of like crazy lunatics that were shotgunning Stella and winning two Michelin stars. You know, it was kind of this uh, like full on immersive experience. And when everyone came to work, they were just in it and on this massive journey. And since then we've kind of removed that, like I've stopped drinking and the whole world has, has, has slightly changed and it's become much more professional and much more driven. But there's, you still have to have that connection, that excitement, that buzz that young chefs have come into, that adrenaline-fueled thing. I think there's a really 
powerful lesson there that we go, well, if you want to be successful, this is how you have to act. This is how you have to dress. This is where you have to go to school. And these have to be your values and your behaviors. And we talk a lot about values, behaviors, non-negotiables on this podcast. But you've just described almost the antithesis of Le Manoir or Gavroche. Yeah. But incredible success. Yeah. We wouldn't be, it wouldn't, I, that, that and I think the dip, I couldn't tell people to behave like that if I wasn't the person that was doing it because it was uncompromised. The food was uncompromised. The quality of the ingredients, the way that we cooked it, the things that came to the past, we, nothing. There was never, ever a that will do attitude when it came to the food, the time. We would be in at work. If we had to be there at six o'clock in the morning, but we hadn't been in bed till two, we'd be, that's it. We'd be there. You'd be there. You'd be there. You would graph. You would work. The lifestyle that kind of surrounded it that I was in was very, very different and it wouldn't work now unless you're that person that's doing it. Now, there's a number of restaurants that have got that high energy that are places even now. So there's a, an amazing chef. It's not the same, but it's got the same sort of kind of connective build energy. Gareth Ward, uh, a restaurant called Inishir, which is number one UK restaurant, which is over in Wales. And, you know, there's a brilliant energy for him, his team. He's created the same sort of thing. And he's been on this journey from zero, one to two stars, so Britain's best restaurant to this. And they've got this... They've got this connection of their team that are all in this together, immersed in this feeling. It's the same thing. If you remove Gareth, like if you remove me at that point, it wouldn't be the same. And you'd, you'd never walk into that kitchen as an owner and want that world to be happening around you because you wouldn't trust it. Did you stumble into this culture or was it a specific, you know, did you look at another chef and think, look how he operated, he was a maverick, that needs to be me or? No, I think what happened is that I was driven to to get to that point. When we won the first Mission Star, we won it within the first 10 months of opening. And my friends within the industry at that point were people like Sat Baines and Claude Bozzi and Simon Rogan, who are now two and three Mission Star chefs that have, and we were all in this driven world and they were top end, smart, amazing restaurants. We were a pub, you know, Daniel Clifford, who's got a place in Cambridge, is, is a, a great mate. And he was the one that rang me up and said, we want a star. And again, Dan, it was all very sharp and pushed and driven. And I was in that world and I started, and they, everyone else started winning two, Daniel had two stars, other chefs, Claude had two stars. And it was just like, you're eating in those restaurants. You start looking at how are they, what, how have they achieved two stars? What have they got? Consistency. They have their own personality. They have a drive for, you know, there is uncompromise in the dining room and the food that comes out of the kitchen. So that drive for perfection, I think is, is probably, a, it's a flaw in my personality that then hit an addiction issue that you go, right, I, I mean it, but I need a release. If I'm driving to this point and I'm pushing myself from 6, 7 a.m. till midnight every single day, like it's a seven day week operation. It was my business, myself and my wife, and that is it. And we are making this work and we are going there. And this is where I'm taking it. This is where I'm gonna go. You always need that release. And I think, you know, a lot of people who are that driven will always find a release clause. And it might be running or it might be, you know, going to the gym or it might be, or, or if you have in that world and you're slightly attracted to that world and that's where it is, it might end up manifest itself in, a, in an addiction issue, whether it's gambling, whether it's drugs or whether it was alcohol. So mine was always a release of them became boozing. And because everything that I do, my life is quite excessive. It suddenly became excessively. It was everything about it was bigger, more than. How excessive? Explain for people what a day or a week might look like. Would you mind? No. Uh, so I would finish service. I never drank during the day, ever, 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 until the last, till the last main course had gone. Uh, last main course had gone. Everyone started clearing down. We're clearing down. we by the, the kitchen. We then get a round of beers. I would probably drink a pint of Negroni. So like a pint of Negroni, I'd probably then do two. So maybe two pints of Negroni, then maybe six pints of Stella, six pints of lager. Then there was a pub that was open down the road that would be open till like late one or two in the morning. So we'd get all the kitchen out and I'd get in there. I don't know, I could easily do another six to eight bottles of Grosch or like, but the pint ones or pints of lager. Then I'd go home and I'd drink probably, I'd do a, I'd do a gin and tonic but it would be a pint glass filled with ice and then I poured a gin all the way to the top and then I put to a, a top it off with tonic and then I'd do it like, so it'd be a, I don't know, I'd do eat, I could do half a bottle of gin, 12 to 16 lagers, two massive Negronis every day. And that, and that would be every day. That would be every day. And then some days it would be 
Some days it would be more. There was a point where, like, if I was, if if I had an evening off and I'd finished work, it, like, in the afternoon and I was going to go for a few beers in the evening and go, like, I'd go and I'd, I'd be drinking lager in the shower as I'd get in water to, go, yeah, to yeah. go out. Like, I would drive around with a case of lager in my car in case I was working somewhere and overnight and the, by the time I finished working, the bar was shut. So at least I'd have 24 cans of Stella in the boot. It was like, it was at that point. It was like, it was... It was Deep, beyond, yeah. yeah, yeah. like it was next level, like yeah. it was beyond, it was massive. But you must have worked your way up to that, it sounds like. Yeah. It wasn't, like you weren't, you didn't start with the two pints. No, it was a challenge. Way. No, 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 it was like, like it's another thing. It was like, well, if I'm going to drink, we drink proper. Like, you know, like when people drink now and they say they're drinkers and they go for a few beers, they do a, like I always, I view it now, even as a non-drinker, like over 10 years now, like everyone, everyone's an amateur. Like your amateurs, like I was real, like the real deal. Like it was like, you know, so it's that, but I built up and you just go and you just start building. Like anything that you do, you get better at it. I got, I, I got very good at it. But where did that desire come from to, to, to want to be seen as a professional drinker? Like yeah. that, and to dismiss others that are amateurs, because it sounds like that was the same identity you had yeah. regarding food. You yeah. weren't, you wasn't enough just to, to, to be a chef you wanted to be the best chef no it was all it was i don't know it, it just felt everything that i did at that time was immersed in the whole thing and we were very lucky because the hand of flowers achieved two mission stars we won uk best restaurant of the year a couple of years in a row we won best pub of the year we won i won great british menu twice in a row i won like so the whole world everything was great and and I was massively drinking. Everything was huge. This, this buzzing world, and it was it was a part of the circle. It was a part of the drive. It was a part of that life of connecting, of driving everything. That push, that desire. And we wouldn't be. I wouldn't be sat here now. I wouldn't be having these conversations. We wouldn't be where we were if I wasn't that person. So I don't regret being that person that? at all, because I think that without that release. I wouldn't have been able to push myself to that far without that up and down. I wouldn't have been, there wouldn't have been any point in put, you just push yourself to that point and then stop. I needed to go there and then get massively drunk and self-indulged and have an amazing, like it was this amazing whirlwind of like five, 10 years of like chaos. I absolutely loved. So do you think when you look back on that then, Tom, that, that you'd have been successful professionally? if you hadn't have been doing that? I think we'd have been very successful to a point. I, I mean, I can't say would we have achieved two mission stars, would we be the people that we are would we, without having gone through that journey. But I love the fact that I've been through that journey. I see they're all life experiences. And, yeah. I lo and then to have gone to that extreme and then to have stopped and gone, right, okay, that's a period now. I'm done with that. I can't do it anymore. I know I can't do it anymore. It's a part of my life. The, the fact that I have complete control over it now is like, I love the fact that I can do that. I love the fact that I I believe that if I go, I can do that, I, c I can do it. I, I, I like that. And they're life lessons. And you only learn that from doing stuff, don't you? This is so interesting because really, every, all of these big moments, whether it's becoming you know, the very best chef you can be and one of the most celebrated chefs in the world or being the very best drinker you can be and leading the way into the pub or making the decision to go right now, it's over. Yeah. All of it is about finding your absolute, being the very, very best you can be. And I, so I wonder whether like, a lot of people think, right, I'm going to stop drinking and there's this fear that comes over them. Can I live without it? How will I be funny without it? Will I have friends without it? Whereas I, I almost get the, the feeling that you would have gone, now I'll show you. Like, here I go. Well, now watch me be a total non-drinker and do it. It's that was exactly it. Yeah. That was exactly it. I was, I was, I was like the head chef that I was working with at the time was like, "You're never going to do that." What are you on about? Like, it wasn't a day that I wouldn't That's go by fuel that for you, though. Like, I imagine. Yeah, it was like, well, I'll, I'll show you. I'll show everyone. I'll show all of you. And it's weird because you have people ask me how you've done it and what you've done, and you worry all of those fears that you talk about there. How am I going to be that funny? Or what's my social group going to be like? What's my but actually, I had a problem, right? So when, if you're just, a, I, and I imagine it's a lot more difficult if you're a casual drinker, right? To then give up drink, because you haven't got a problem, but you probably drink more than you should, but you want to give up a bit less, but you haven't got an issue. I think if you've got a problem, you recognize that there's a big thing that you've got to deal with. 
So you have to change your social outlook, your social standing, what you do, how you go. If your life was always about being in the bar, going out until late at night, being in clubs, doing whatever else, you have to go, actually, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do that. So when you say to people, that's not me anymore, I'm not doing that, I'm going to show you. Two of my greatest friends, two chefs, that were also massive drinkers, big drinkers, really into it, the same, we'd all be on it together, we'd all, who were, um, I, at first, you think they're going to be like, oh, come on, just what? The, the, your truest friends, when you say to them, I've got a massive issue here, I've got to change it, we're going to do, I'm not going to do it again, they were like, amazing, brilliant, right, what do we need to do to help? We'd still go out, you'd still go, like, you know, you'd be a part of, and they were massive. So your real friends are the ones that help you through it. They're the ones that are supportive. They're the ones. And that's when you start recognizing the rest of it is just noise. It doesn't matter. And if you think about your life and people who go to the pub, I don't know, five or six times a week and they go and they go to the same pub and they're local. And I love local life and I love the idea of it. But when I look back at it and I go, I would go to the pub and I would meet people that I saw the night before and they tell me the same story. And it would be the same thing. And it would be this repetitive world of actually achieving nothing. And we might be watching the football on the telly or you might be doing whatever. And it's, and it's lovely, but not every day. I've got to snap out of this. And that was the point where you realize actually your real mates, the ones that are really close. And that if you are an achiever and you want to do stuff, it's not about being stuck in the pub every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night, just like, that's lovely. And it's great if that's where people's world want to be, but it wasn't where I wanted to be. I wanted to be doing something else. I needed to change. But I'm intrigued at, at, at that decision because looking from the outside, there's a lot of courage required in it because professionally all your success has been built on you being the driving force and creating this band of brothers where you all go and uh, to extremes socially. So you're risking commercial success by daring to do something different on that. So what was the problem that that was bigger than that risk that you were doing? What was the moment when you thought, I've got an issue here and need to do something? So it was an age thing. So I was approaching 40. And I think 40 for many people does get to a point of reflection. Like there is a point, like one of my best mates described it as halfway to death. And you're like, and you go, <laughs> nice. like yeah, exactly. That's cheery. Yeah. yeah, it's like, oh yeah, great. Like, but yeah. jokingly, but then you go, actually, well, I suppose if you do live to 80, you go, yeah, I'm halfway there. And you go, well, what have I achieved? Where have I gone? And where am I going to go? And then and that was the point. I was 39 and I was like, do you know what? If I keep doing this, I ain't, I'm not going to get 50. I know I'm not. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm over 30 stone. I'm drinking 20 pints of lager, half a bottle of gin a day. Is it... No, no one's getting through that. Like, we're not stupid. We all know that if you smoke 30 cigarettes a day, you only eat Mars bars and you drink 20 pints of lager, you're going to be in a world of pain. Like, we, we're not stupid, but it's to snap out of that. You have to have the mentality to go, I'm not, you have to start making decisions, correct and right decisions at that point. And that was the point, it was a point of reflection. It was about being, it was an age thing. It wasn't a health, I didn't have a health scare. Although, I mean, if I went to the doctors, I would have scared them. Like the whole, right. like the whole, but it wasn't a particular thing. I hadn't, didn't have a blackout or a collapse or a thing. It was just a point of going, do you know what, I'm, I'm coming up to 40. I've got to do something here. I've got to change. The moment I stopped drinking, like I swam every day, but I wasn't like, and but, I started swimming much better. Everything started beginning to f click into place and you started going, it's a whole new world that I'd never experienced. Like I, I played quite a bit of sport when I was younger, up to the age of like 18, when I, before I went into a kitchen and then it all just disappears because you're just in that world. And then all of a sudden you started, feeling, I mean, I'd always been, I mean, kitchens are very physical places. I mean, I was massive, but all day long, 16 hours a day on your feet, moving, doing stuff, cooking is hard, fast, quick. Like, it's for a big unit, I was fast and good and quick at it. But all of a sudden, the reality, the clarity of thought, the, the thinking process was completely different. Started realizing that, you know, that is so far removed from where a normal human being should be. What we should be doing is much more movement, much more understanding. You know, getting up in the morning, having a pint of coffee and six Nurofen is not the way to start the day. Do you know what I mean? Like actually, you know, do it, changing those thought processes and I, all of that, I couldn't agree with more. The more, and it's weird, the more you exercise, the more you take control of yourself, the more you understand it, the, the, it is easier to make better choices. I mean, if you've just drank 
16 pints of lago, you go home and you, you're it's two in the morning, you're having cheese on toast, aren't you? And a whole tub of Pringles, because that's like easy, because you're a bit battered and you're just making those decisions. You know, if you're not doing that, you're not eating that shit, are you? It's just kind of, you know. You... Well, there's something about like alcohol is almost a numbing agent as well. You don't have to think too much. And I'm interested that when you chose to forgo alcohol, what did that do emotionally? Like, what were the kind of feelings that you'd been numb to that you were now exposed to? Well, it, I wasn't trying to numb anything. I was just trying to release the the energy and the levels of pressure. And it took me a while to find what it was because if I then had an evening off, I'd, I couldn't go to the pub. I couldn't go into those. So I wouldn't go into the pub and then just go and drink a Diet Coke because I was in that environment. And I wouldn't put myself in that space because I couldn't trust myself and I wouldn't be that person. So I had to find new releases, new things to try and do. And, you know, going swimming was a big thing. Walking the dogs was a big thing. Trying to just be a bit more connected to my wife, trying to be a bit more connected to the world, taking note of what was going on and just... That was the hardest part. I think the first year was really, really difficult of trying to find new social habits or new things to do and removing yourself from those environments. There was a point, actually, it was one of the most scary moments from being a non-drinker. It was about two and a half years into not drinking. I was working at the hand and I rang Beth up and it was about 9.30 and we just sent him the last main course. I said, look, it's quite quiet. Should we do want to meet in one of the pubs in town? So I thought, well, I'm cool with that. I'll go and we went into town, busy little pub bar. It was great. Came in, Beth had a glass of wine or a gin and tonic or something. I, I went, do you know what? Actually, I might have a Bex, I'll have a Bex Blue, non-alcoholic beer. I'd not had, you know, I just thought it's non-alcoholic. It's cool. I'm good with that. It was the connection of the process. There's no alcohol. The opening of the beer, the smell still smells like beer. The taste, it was like the, 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 the I don't know, the neuron, everything just suddenly connected. I did eight of them in 20 minutes. I was like, I was on it. I was on. I was on it. I was on it. And I was. I was like, I stopped and I looked at Beth. I was like, Is it? Is it? I, I found myself in this whole world again. It was terrible. I was like, in 20 minutes, I've done eight bottles of non-alcoholic beer. I'm in that zone of chaos again. I've got got to remove myself. And that was the, that was the final point of just going. That's it. I cannot. I can't associate. Yeah, I can't yeah. have anything non-alcoholic like you know because it takes you into this world. There's this little kind of like. And some, some like demon thing that's in there that just grabs it. And it shows you he's still there. Yeah, exactly. And it goes, and that was the point that made me go, I can't go near it. I can't, I can't go near it. So I'm intrigued about like the environment, the context is you're in a pub, you're with your wife, yeah. you've got what looks like alcohol in front of you. So the context is key in this environment to then trigger those yeah. old behaviors. So take us into the kitchen the environment that you've now created where you're not leading the way of going on the piss yeah. uh, after service. What was the difference pre <laughs> and post? i got to be honest, I think probably a lot of the guys in the kitchen were quite relieved because I wasn't <laughs> making them go to the pub. The and cheerleaders, drink and do that. They finally. Were, they were like, oh thank my God. God. Like, I think yeah. some of them were like, oh my God, thank God for that. Thank God that time's over. Like, I, like, right. you know, I think, but then some of them were still on it. They they were still doing. They were still living their amazing chef lives. It kind of changed a little bit. It went through processes when it wasn't being led or booze led, and it was being. And then I was going home at ten ten thirty or doing whatever and letting them get on with their world. They always they they circulate to new things. It was either whether it was going to I don't know strip clubs, whether drugs came into it, whether things happened. They, they all found their own different like, and you go through cycles of what everyone's doing, and it kind of we have to move it on. Whether it was gambling, whether it was there was always something that like it, that kind of environment or those kind of um, people will gravitate to a connection, you know, of doing something. But it has most definitely moved in the 10 years since I've stopped drinking to the way that the kitchen works now. I mean, if you go in there now, there's a load of younger that we we pay for gym membership, right? So they're all, mem that, I mean, they're on their days off or coming into work, they're all bench pressing. They're all doing, they're all at the gym. They're all, there's a new, it's the new generation. They're not drinking. They're taking much more I care see of chefs, themselves. Like, you know, every time I see a, an emerging, I hate the phrase, celebrity chef yeah. or an emerging great chef, they've got their six packs out on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. It feels different now, doesn't it? Very much. It really is. And I, I think that's because, that's not just because that kitchen environment is different, because those people are still attracted to the kitchen, but they're finding it in something else. It's not necessarily alcohol-led. And it may, at the minute, there is a drive to health, vitality, looking after your body. Like, in some cases, unhealthy in terms of mental, but actually the body is a lot healthier than drinking 20 pints of lager. So people are much more connected 
And that is a generational thing. Yeah. And then it's manifested itself into kitchens as well. Can we talk then about creating a culture, yeah. about hiring people, about sharing your vision, about moving a business in the direction you want it to go? You know, at yeah. the beginning, you said you used to be the young, the young player, then yeah. you became the coach and then the manager. Now, you know, you're... I suppose you're the owner, right? I don't want to offend yeah. either of you, but you're yeah, like yeah, yeah. you're like the glazers of uh, yeah. the cooking. Oh, no, Sorry, no, 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 I knew no, you'd hate no, that. No, no, no. <laughs> Martin Edwards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I knew the mention of those in front of a, a couple of United fans might <laughs> cause a problem. No, um, no, he's Jim Radcliffe now. Yeah, we yeah. Are. There you go. <laughs> right, you're the Jim Radcliffe <laughs> cooking yeah, well. Yeah. Um, I'd love to know how you create culture and what advice you'd give to other people listening to this. Yeah. For, for adding to a positive nurture and culture in a business. So one of the biggest things that we're so proud of more than anything else isn't necessarily the accolades, the awards. It's, you know, the business has been there and Hand of Flowers is approaching 19 years old. Um, and we have people that have been in that business 17, 15 years, 10 years, 12 years. Like that we've got so, we must have about 30 people in that company that have done over 10 years with us. And we've got another 15 that are approaching 10. You know, there's so many people that have been a part of that journey. And because lots of them were with us at the beginning when I was that person, they were in that. And the best way you used to describe it, like we used to laugh about it in the kitchen, it's like I would dump a load of these people in a rucksack with us and we were going up a mountain. We are going on this mountain. I am, we are all going together and you're going to, but you're going to push. We're all going to do, we're all doing this together. And those people have been with us in that business from the beginning. And they're still the same people that drive the DNA of that business. And it is not something that happens overnight. It's something that you create with a team and it's something that you connect with people. You guys here, I'm sure as you're making this podcast, it's very successful, been going for a long time. I'm sure there's a lot of people that have been on it from the beginning or people that have understood the culture of what you're trying to create. And you build that. You understand it as well as I do, but you have to connect with individuals. You have to tie them together. You have to build those pieces. You also have to be ruthless and brutal when the people aren't right and get rid of them because you can't have, you have to disconnect people you have to cut them out if they're not in they have the right mindset if they're not in the business for the right reason but you have to have a skill set whoever's leading it has to understand people and has to allow people to give them a chance an opportunity to grow you have to understand where they're going and what they want to get out of it and if you as a company can offer that to them and encourage them you, and and it is a two-way thing People have to come into your business with 100%. They want to have to work hard. They want to have to um, commit to doing something, achieving things. You're trying to achieve the best podcast. We're trying to achieve the best pub. We're trying to achieve, you know, and we have to do that every single day. Every single time you're doing it, you want to create something amazing. So if you're coming into this and you're just, it's just a job, mm. it's just coming, you're just coming to work, yep. you're not the right person. Now, that's not to say that we don't need people that just come to work because the Hand and Flowers, as 19 bedrooms, it is open seven days a week. We need people that work, that come to work, that will just do, I don't know, 30 hours a week and just doing a thing because it's part of their life. We need those bodies, but actually the key, the key driving force and those people that just come to work know that when they come into that environment, there's some amazing people that have committed, you know, Lourdes, who's our general manager, has been with us for 17 years. She's committed 17 years of her life. Like Katie, who's our restaurant manager, 15 years this next week, 15 years of her life. She's committed to a bit. Now that for me is an honor. I'm privileged. I'm so like, my God, she, 15 years of someone's life is absolutely huge to their like growth, their determined, their determination. They want to be a part of it, but they've, that I've had their lives, their careers in my hands. Now that is a massive responsibility. So I feel like hugely responsible for all of them. So you have to connect and understand. So building that culture comes from, I think you have to connect with individuals and you have to allow them to grow personally and professionally. You have to give them opportunities. You have to stand back as well. Let them grow and make mistakes. Businesses don't grow unless a mistake's made. But what you're describing there, Tom, is really interesting. There's some really interesting research that there's three ways we view a task. We view it as a job, a career, or a calling. So a job is you just come in and you just, yeah. you, you, you might just be 
yeah. rather than a... Yeah, you're trying to earn some money yeah, to make some potatoes money. and yeah, it's yeah. more about that. Yeah. A career is you want to buy those potatoes as well as you can because you'd like to get a head chef position. Yeah. And a calling is where you're going, no, no, we want to be doing something spectacular. We want to be changing the industry. We want to be delivering this incredible experience. Now, you've obviously had this sense of calling, that moment when you arrived in it. How would you describe that? So when you're recruiting somebody to come and work with you, how do you sort of entice them or seduce them and go, this is what we're doing here, you can be a part of this? So firstly, you'd hope that they kind of understand what the business is before they even get there. They've done a little bit of research. They don't necessarily have to know who I am, but they have to know where they're applying for a job, what they're doing. You know, they, they come into a space that has acc accolades and is recognised and is, you know, relatively busy in the world of restaurants um, and is established. But from, from a front of house point of view, I've never employed anybody um, front of house that has experience of worked in amazing places on just on their CV. Um, I've always employed people and we've always employed people that have turned up with a personality. They need to connect. If you connect with a guest when they walk through the door, you say hello. It doesn't matter about the skill set. You can learn all of that. That's just a trade. The, the personality trait is the most important. Now, that is something that we can't teach. That's something that you own as individuals. When you walk through that door, you either want to be there and you want to be in this world or you don't. So if you're front of house and you're coming in and you say, hello, nice to meet you, how are you? Great, we're in, we're on, brilliant, let's go. You, you're hired, doesn't matter of your skill set because all the other bits we can teach you. And they're only processes. They're easy to learn. You put the plate down there. Actually, the Hand of Flowers is a very difficult site to run. We have 16 tables. Some are stuck in a corner. Some, they've been the original tables. It's been there for 19, nothing's changed. But there isn't stand to the right, serve to the left. There isn't like some of the dishes we have to pass over to the guests because we can't get to them because they're in a corner. So it's a two mission star space where we're giving you your own food. You know, it's like, but you can only get away with that if you can connect with the guests. You can only be, hello, welcome, here you go, do you mind taking that? Like, and that's so important. Their personality traits, they're really important. And then kitchen skill set, the way I always think that you can tell that a chef is going to be immersed and good in it is if they have a little sense of self-confidence, but not over the top. A lot of chefs are over the con not, like overconfident. Like, but actually, if they come into a kitchen, and we're in this world now of social media and Instagram and whatever else, and chefs can travel anywhere in the world from social media. But if they come into the kitchen and they're on a trial, if when it comes to lunch service and the food is at the pass under the hot lights and it all looks amazing before it goes to the guests, if they're there looking at that, looking at the food on the plate and going, oh, that looks amazing, this is brilliant, this is fantastic, blah, blah, blah. You go, okay, well, they might be good. They're looking at the end result. But the chef that you really want is the one that when the produce is in at 8.30 in the morning and they're looking at the piece of fish whole, like on the bone, the sea bass, or they're looking at the beef fillet, or they're looking at the, they're looking at the pro, they're looking at the ingredient and they're going, wow, I want to do something with that. I want to go through the process of cooking, not the pretty picture at the end. Cause that pretty picture at the end only exists fucking once, right? Once does the guest have it. Once do they go take a photo of them for their Instagram page. The moment they've cut it, that's it, it's done. Right, that picture's gone. So if you've got, if it tastes like shit, but it looks pretty, right? The moment you've smashed it up, it doesn't look pretty. It still tastes like shit. Like <laughs> it's got to taste amazing. So the chefs that you go, these are the ones. These are the ones that you can build on. Are the ones that go, these carrots are mega. They, I've never seen kale like this. This sea bass is fantastic. The, where do you get your cheese from? How does that like? When they ask process, the understanding of the ingredient. That's when you go. These guys are going to, this they've got potential to go so, so far because they're excited about that, not the pretty picture. And I think there's an interesting thing we can talk about here about you going in and having your attention on those tiny details that we wouldn't even see in a kitchen. Yeah. But you being able to see them, but, but using that not to make people feel intimidated, but almost to make people feel like I'm walking alongside Tom Kerridge here. Like he's, a criticism has been a great thing that you've come over and yeah. taken the time to help them. Yeah, every space that I go into, no matter where it is, whether it's the butcher's tap, which we got two of now, which is like burgers and fries on a tray, like served, like all the 
two mission sign up. Everywhere I go into, the first thing I do is go in and I go all around the kit and say hello to everyone, fist bump or handshake, and just say, how are you getting on? How are you doing? How are you doing? Just that point of connection. I, I install it in my, actually my eight-year-old now. So when, we, when we've had dinner or had lunch or whatever, I was, come on, you have to get, go in the kitchen and say thank you. We have to go in and say thank you. You have to go and say, we have to connect. And that's really, really important to go and say thank you, to go and be a part of, you know, something. And that, but that culture is then driven by the team. It is, it, you're right, like it is their responsibility. It's their kitchens to run. It's their spaces. It's their restaurants. It's their front of house teams. You know, the restaurant managers have to do the same. They have to create their own culture, but that culture is led by us and me. So it is about, and you have to allow them to do it. You have to let them get on and do it. And if they're not doing it, you have to point out to them, why is it? Why is this shit? They've gone in there and that's not right. So when you walk in them, what do you look for? Like, what are the telltale signs that you go, yeah, this is the right place with, with the right All the wrong place. place. All the wrong place. Yeah. To be honest, I can't tell you. It's an, it's an energy. It's a vibe. I think it's the same as when people talk about how do you create the best restaurant. Like, And you can have, and I'm sure we've all been in it, right, where you've gone and eaten in a Michelin-style restaurant, uh, so you know it's going to be great food, but you go in there and everything is sharp and everything is crisp and pristine and everything is amazing and the food is really good and you go away you come away, you go, I don't know, what, what, everything was great about that, but I can't quite put my finger on what was, why it's not, why have I not gone? And it's because it's a connection, it's a soul, and that's the most important thing. Some of the best food I've ever had has not been in those tight, sharp restaurants. Some of the best food I have has been in those restaurants. But some of the best food I've had might be, I don't know, cheap fish and chips with malt vinegar sat on a beach like in Brighton when the wind is blowing and you're sat there with a the connect because the, it just suits that environment or a, a taco shack that I had something to eat in Tucson in Arizona like and then there's a queue of people and you've just got this greasy amazing Brit but everything about it was fantastic or street food in Singapore or you know those sort of things you go because there's soul there's reason and those are the sort of things you look for and then when I go into a restaurant and you go into a space irrespective of mine or somebody else's you know you walk into it it could be just a pub Pub. You walk in, there could be two pubs on the same street, same offering, same thing. You go into one and there's something about it. You go, actually, this is where I want to stay and have a couple of beers with my mates and catch up and do whatever else. You go into the other one and there's just a feeling of, and that comes from an energy and that energy comes from people and then it's in, it goes into the building and they, they're the things that make it work. And I can't tell you what that is apart from a, almost a holistic style of soul that human beings can give to spaces an energy and, and and an ethic and a hard work ethic and a care and all of those little bit there's an ingredient that you can't add and it's the same within food and cooking you cannot add um those restaurants that you walk away and it's been stark it's because the food's not been cared for it's been pristine it's been put on with tweezers and everything about it is sharp and crisp but it's not about the flavor it's not about the taste it's not done with love like one of the Everything has to be done with love. Biggest thing we say at the Hand of Flowers is every time a dish goes onto the pass before it goes to the guest, there has to be a little bit of sadness in the chef that's on the pass that he's not eating that dish. He's going, oh, God, that looks fucking great. That's what I want to eat that. That's what you want. Those are things. And that, when you cook something with love, it makes so much more difference. And no one can tell you what that. Your mum's Sunday roast. The carrots may be overcooked and shit, but actually your mum's love doing it. And when you've had it, you go, it's great. It tastes lovely. Everything about it is brilliant. It's a gift it's like, from your mum. It's it, a, exactly. a hug, isn't it? And it's that like, yeah. soul, I, I, honestly, I genuinely believe that's something that comes through in food. I, so then can I ask you about, because I've never been in kitchens, but you've got, I've got the impression about they're often quite antagonistic places, effing and blinding at each other. The way, you know, you yeah. know, like the Gordon Ramsay image of Hell's Kitchen of calling people out. And I'm interested. I, don't, I know that's just a very one-dimensional view from yeah. um, from a certain program that I've watched. Yeah, I'm interested in terms of how do you teach people to conduct themselves with each other? Then, because to talk about love in the kitchen, to me, also replies that you treat each other with respect and dignity and courtesy. Yeah. So I'm interested in terms of how how people so behave. The process in your of understanding of youngsters coming through, and you go, you know, then you're expecting 22 year olds respect to an eight, respect for an 18 year old is to be because at some point that 22 year old was where that 18 year old was, and there is, it's like being on a training field. The day that you, the moment you get in there, 
it's the training at eight o'clock in the morning. It's about the training, the process. No, move there, stand that there, get that going there. Let's hurry, hurry up with that, hurry up with that. It's not about being aggressive, but it is about getting things done. Right. There is a, there has to be a sense of urgency and a sense of want. We're talking about high performance here. You, you can't go, there's nothing lazy. You can't, there's nothing flabby. There's nothing flabby about it. Your business has to be like, has to run. The kitchen has to run like the guys are at the gym. You're committed, you're doing it, you're, do, you're, 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 you're working. You're working, you're there to work and you're working with the process of trying to achieve. And at the same point, you want to learn. So you're asking, you're 18, you're asking the 22-year-old what's going on there. The 22-year-old is continually learning from the 26-year-old. The 26-year-old is then learning, what, you know, just taking those, they're all next steps and they're all parts and parts of the journey. And it's all about the encouragement and growth. And sometimes those environments are too much for people because it is a high pressure environment but you are performing you have to be and sometimes it becomes quite frightening when you're 18 you know 19 you've only had your peer group that you've dealt with they're only been 18 year olds that are your friends and the only points of people telling you what to do have been your school teacher or your parents do you know what i mean there so all of a sudden you go into a work environment and there's someone who's a bit older than you a bit more experienced and telling you what to do and then all of a sudden there's a big owner that comes in or the restaurant manager or the thing you know all of a sudden there's so many different levels of understanding finding yourself in society and in a world but kitchens are also very protective they are in their own environment they are you do become part of a team we do know that We've all been there. We've all been that 18 year old. We've all, so yes, we do have to kind of find that balance of encouragement, but also there is an expectation level on you to want to own self progression, to want to drive yourself to high performance. How do I get the best from me? If you're not pushing yourself, I'm not going to push you. You know, like you've, you've got to want it. You've got to want it. Otherwise, there's no point in being there. You can go and work somewhere else and do really well as a chef but and just enjoy the cooking and just enjoy being there. But if you want to push yourself, you want to progress, you want to go places, then you have to go and work in those sort of environments. I love how much we've spoken about the soft skills related to cooking today rather than the hard skills. Yeah. You know, we haven't even spoken about how do you cut the perfect baton. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like what, yeah. what makes... The... That's the easy bit. <laughs> but, that's, but that's where I think a lot of people make the mistake in life. They think the hard skill is where they have to focus. And you've come in here and you've spoken to us about culture. You've, you know, almost quite spiritual talking about how you create a, an environment in a kitchen and the people that you bring on the journey and connecting to their heart, not their head and all these things. And before we wrap up with our quick fire questions, I, I do want to finish talking about the work that you do outside the kitchen. Yeah. Because your desire to reach down and lift other people up is absolutely clear and it's commendable. Um, and we live in a world where I grew up in a house where my mum was a home economics teacher or food technology, they called yeah. it in the end, didn't they? And I used to go and sit at the back of the classroom when I finished school early and cook with her and her kids. She's devastated to this day that it's just been downgraded in the kind of standings within school. Now, what's the one thing we all do three times a day if we're lucky, eat food? So I'd love to know from you, what do you want our world for young people to look like at, in school, out of school, at home? Like, what should we all be doing to talk about and think about food in the, in the right way? My God, I mean, there's so many different points, but I, I think the world of inequality and poverty, child food poverty is massive. It's a huge thing. Trying to do a lot of work with Fair Share, setting up the full-time meals campaign that we set up with Marcus a while ago and trying to create an environment and drive free school meals is something I think is incredibly important. The word free should just be removed from it. It should just be school meals, right? Everybody should get, I think, a school meal, right? And I know that there'll be a two, where's the cost come from? But actually, this is a long-term thing, okay? This is really important. One, it removes stigmatism. If you qualify for free school meals, um, you have to stand in a different line or you have to get, like, all of a sudden you feel like a, a different person that's removed from a society space. Like you already feel different. You're already from a, in a social standing. You know, you're learning that as an 11-year-old that it's not, that's not right. That, I mean, that's just not right. So from school meals should be, um, it's for some kids, it's the one hot meal they get that day. It's the one point of nutrition, um, hydration. All those sort of things are really important for learning. And it's just not those kids that benefit from that. It's like the whole classroom, you know, we do, teachers can then spend, you know, if you're disruptive, if you're a disruptive child because you're not, because you're hungry and you've not got enough, to, you haven't had enough to drink, eat or drink, then your teacher is spending time with the disruptive child not teaching. Like even the bright kids with who've, who've, who've got 
school meals, whose parents cook them tea when they go home. We've got that space. Right now, this is a place where actually everyone will benefit from that. Long-term health gain will be huge. An understanding of food and environment. You talk there, your, your mum, we lost home economics or, you know, food tech or whatever it is. And I kind of half understand that. I get it. I get it because in this day and age, reading, writing, you know, a commitment to, uh, I, I suppose, more curriculum-based learning. I, I kind of get it. I understand it. You know, it would be a fair argument to someone to push back on that. But then you could go, right, okay. But if we made everyone school meet, school lunch was just part of it. But with that school lunch became came a recipe sheet or an understanding of where those ingredients came from or how it did. There could be a bit more of an understanding, a connection to food because everyone sat there eating it in the same environment and they're all having the same thing. Now, school meals have come on so much more from when I, we were kids, right? They're, like they're massive. They're amazing. When you go and see them, actually, some of the companies that are doing amazing, incredible things with it. But the other big problem is that most companies that are doing it, they're, they're boardroom led. They're companies. They're, they're there for profit. They're there for profit. Now, even if that profit is like two pence on a school meal, they're still making a profit out of school meals. Well, how's that? Right. I mean, we shouldn't be making, companies shouldn't be making a profit out of school meals when some kids don't even qualify. Their parents qualify for universal credit, but they don't qualify for a free school meal because on the means testing there is a different means testing for the free school meal. Well, if you qualify, we already know then, if you if you qualify for universal credit, your parents are in a position here where there is an economic challenge that they're facing. I think, you know, it's great, but it, there's so many really awkward and horrible juxtapositions, particularly when it comes to food poverty, that, but a lot of it can be helped with universal credit instantly meaning that you qualify for free school meals, the term free being dropped and everyone just getting school meals and a form of education that could come into a classroom from that point of view, I think would be a great, would be a wonderful starting point. That's that's a first point, I think. Well done. Very, very well said. <laughs> Final question before the quick fires. We sit here today. It's been an incredible journey. Yeah. You have so many things in front of you. I loved what you said at the beginning that you almost don't feel successful because I think that's the trait of a lot of high performance people. But what is it today? Like, what drives you now to get up, to write the books, to make the TV shows, to run the restaurants, to nurture the, the next generation? The fear factor of everything drives me to keep me going. That's a massive one. But also because I love it. It's what I, I love the world of hospitality. I love restaurants. I love chefs. I love front of house teams. I love guests. I love, I love creating those environments. We have six spaces and I love everything about it. I've been, like I said, right at the beginning, 18 years old, fell into a space when I'm so lucky to have gone, wow, this is amazing. And I still love it. So the two driving forces of fear, but also because it is what I do. You know, it is what I am. It is what I do. If all the media stuff ended, if all the books ended, if all the restaurants, but one ended, it, I, I'm cool. It's great. I'm still in it. You know, I still love it. I absolutely love it. And that I'm massively grateful. Very good. Right. Ready for some quick fire yes. questions? The three non-negotiable behaviours that you and the people around you should buy into? Uh, communication skills, which is massive. Saying hello, being a part of something. Uh, encouragement like of people around you. That, and that's so important. Recognising that you, you have been that person. You're not, you're not straight away this legend that knows everything. You're not. And we're still a, it's still a learning curve, right? So recognition that encouragement it is massive. Um, and I think the, the other one is no never fear getting something wrong don't ma don't fear making mistakes like making mistakes are so important to progression they really are they're so important to you know don't keep making the same mistake because that's just stupid <laughs> but like make a mistake learn from it move on like and don't don't let it because it's also in the past there's no point in dwelling on something so make mistakes don't be scared of making mistakes they're part of a growth process brilliant if you could only have one food for the rest of your life what would you pick well, I get asked this quite a lot. So by, by one food, you mean like a sausage or like, if see, because it, it, I can black it and go pork, right? Because you can make so much, you can nose the tail eating, you can make ham, bacon, sausages. I get like there's so much. I go pork or dairy. So dairy, either one, dairy, because then you've got cheese, butter, you've got creme fraiche, you've got cream you can make. Like, so, but pushed, I would say pork. What's the one killer question you love aren't asking when you meet a new potential hire to really understand them? Uh, where was the last place you ate and what did you enjoy about it? And I want them to say, I'm quite happy for them to say McDonald's. I'm quite happy for them to say KFC. Do they ever? 
Yeah. Oh, sorry. Do they ever? Mm, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Some, yeah. Fair like, play to them. Yeah. yeah some, like late night dominoes or a thing. Like I'm quite happy. And what did you enjoy? Why? What was good about that? And I quite like the fact. Listen, Big Mac burger sauce is great. There's a there's a reason why that burger has been around for ages and is very like I'm, I don't ever ever eat them. Like I'm not into the fast food actually, but there's something about that burger sauce, the connection of like the mustard and the mayonnaise and the chopped gherkins and the thing. Like, and you, there's a flavour profile. There's an understand. So I don't mind. Like I like. It doesn't matter what the answer is. Like they think I'm looking for them saying, oh yeah, the fat duck or like you know like something the lebri or wherever it is. Like super excited. But no, I want them to be like brutally honest. And what did you like about it? Nice, brilliant. And finally, your your one golden rule, I guess, for for living a high performance life. What's the What's the last message you'd like to leave people with after this really interesting, wide-ranging, fascinating conversation? What, I, what do you his know? commitment. I, I think his commitment and sacrifice. Um, I think for anybody to achieve anything, if I look back at the amount that I've sacrificed and risk and and backing yourself, and they're all they're all intertwined. I think, and I think you have to do it. You have to back. Nobody else is going to do it for you. The only person that can do this is you. So the only person that has to put that risk is you. The only person that has to push themselves is you. And you can be surrounded by lots of people telling you that's what you got to do. But if you don't do it, it's only you that can do it. So it it's risk, it's sacrifice, and it's commitment. And that makes it sound like it's a really shit thing. Because if you say to everyone, you have to risk everything, you have to sacrifice so much, and you have to be fully, fully committed, right? How many people go, oh, yeah, that's for me. It makes it sound like it's really shit, but actually the benefits of that are massive. They're huge. You, you, are, you are in control of your own destiny, and I wouldn't swap that for anything. What a conversation. Thank you so much. Mate, I love Pleasure, that. Gents. I love that. Pleasure.